and I worked six days a week. We were closed on Sundays, uh, but I worked a lot of times when other people were dating, I was working. So we worked there. Uh, I had broke down vehicles. Uh, she had broke down vehicles, but we survived. Uh, and the biggest thing I had was a lack of funds to buy gas. And I worked at a gas station. But uh, I don't know how many times we ran out of gas or run on fumes, and we'd go to the Star Palace. Nobody knows what Star Palace is, but me and maybe Dwayne and Marilyn may remember. It was a video game um, place that you went and played video games. How many of y'all did that? You didn't do that at home. You didn't have video games. You went to a place that had Miss Pac-Man and uh, Pac-Man and uh, Galaga and uh, all these games, and you put a quarter in and you played uh, video games. We spent more money on video games than we did on gas, and that's the problem, isn't it? So uh, I, I've thought, you know, I wish I could go back and get some of those quarters that I put in those machines. Um, but just running out of gas and trying to make a living, and uh, she stuck with me through all that, 39-plus years. Isn't that great? She's had a great life, hasn't she? Uh, she really has. So... Uh, not not a lot's changed in 39 years, and uh, actually about 44 years, because we dated four years before we got married. But uh, when it came to fuel, I, I begged, borrowed, stole whatever I could do to get fuel. The thing was, what did it? What was fuel when we were in junior high, Neil? 80, 80 cents, 86 cents a gallon. Did, 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 it was cheap. We didn't have 86 cents to put, put gallon because you had to go to the Star Palace to play games with a quarter. But, uh, but man, there were so many times that uh, we were just, we were running on fumes. You could pick up Coke bottles and go sell them and get some, get some change. We did that too. Uh, and, and keep, keep a, keep some cash flowing anyway, but, uh, you know, the parable that we look at this morning is in uh, Matthew chapter 25, and that story kind of reminds me uh, of the days I ran out of gas. Now, how, how, is that, how that relates is this, kind of the point of this parable is there's a lot of believers and non-believers running on empty. I mean, they just, they're just making it. They're just surviving from, from day to day. Some of them may not even be, uh, be surviving at all. And really, sometimes even worse, to alleviate the conditions, they try to survive on the fuel of others rather than filling their own tank. So they, they just use the fuel of others. And as we've done in the last week, as we've looked at this series, uh, we need to kind of take a few moments to put this into context. As I said, the parable is in Matthew chapter 25. This parable is in a section known as the Olivet Discourse. That's, there's several things there. It's found in Matthew chapter 24 and 25. And the disciples asked Jesus about the return, his return and the end of age. And it says in Matthew 24, 3, as Jesus said on the Mount of Olives, and that's why it's called the Olivet Discourse, uh, the disciples came to him privately, just them and Jesus, saying, tell us when these things will be so that we will know the sign of your coming and the end of the age. So they come, they say, tell us about the things you've been teaching about. How can we know so we can recognize the, the time is coming, the end of the age is coming. So after Jesus answered their question in some detail, he gives an object list lesson using a fig tree. Now, this is all in the past. Uh, he cites the example of the way people are living during that day, and he, he uses this fig tree as an example, uh, and he compares to the days living prior to the flood, which they would have all been familiar with that, and how things were going during those times. And he, he says his coming, his future coming, will be like a thief in the night. Uh, it'll come suddenly... And at the beginning of verse 45 of Matthew 25, he, uh, cha chapter 24, he gives four parables. 
And in these four parables, they illustrate how the disciples are to live in the light of the fact that uh, the future coming of Christ is unknown. So what he's done, he's, he's, they've asked about the signs of the coming of uh, when you're going to return, the coming, the end of the age is coming, and, and Jesus says, okay, here's some parables. And the first parable he, he talks about is about the wicked servant and his master. Then the second is about the one we're going to look at this morning, the parable of the ten virgins. Uh, The next one he talks about refers to what we call the parable of the talents. And uh, the last, the fourth one, concludes with the the parable of the sheep and the goats. So he gives those four parables in this same teaching. We're just going to look at one of them today. And we start there in Matthew chapter 25, starting in verse 1. Jesus says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish and five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flask of oil with their lamps. And as the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight there was a cry, and here's the bridegroom, come out and meet him. And all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will not be enough oil for us and for you, go go together to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were there going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. And after the other virgins came, also saying, Lord, Lord, open it to us. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour that the Son of Man will come. So that's the the parable that he gives, and he's talking about the end of time. He's talking about his return. He's talking about the coming of Christ. And before uh, we go any farther, as we've done in the past, I kind of want to give you a little background. You're going to be familiar with this, I think, some of you because I preached kind of in-depth on this a few months ago. Uh, But to to get an idea that we understand the wedding process and what's taking place, I think it's it's important that we understand that because the the people that he's teaching, his disciples, would have understood the whole process. So in a Jewish wedding during that time, it, it contained three different elements, the Jewish wedding. The first was the the engagement phase. Now, during the engagement phase, uh, the father's bride and the groom's uh, father negotiated a price, okay? So they would sit down, they would negotiate the price. Uh, so uh, the, the, uh, the father of the bride would have to, pri- or the father of the groom would have to pay the father of the bride. It wasn't not so much built on the two individuals, but it was built more on a financial agreement. So the, the two fathers would sit down, the, they would talk about the financial arrangements, they'd talk about the agreement. Uh, that was the engagement period, and after that, uh, went through that process, and they came up with a price. Then the next phase was the betrothal period, and we, we hear that's kind of a biblical term, we don't use that. But during that time, the bride and groom would actually exchange vows, and they would be legally married at that point. So they've exchanged vows, they're legally married. However, they would not live together. They wouldn't consummate the marriage uh, until a later time. So after they were, uh, the, the, the uh, price was figured out, it was agreed upon, they went, they exchanged vows, they became legally married. At that point, the groom would leave and he would start building a house. Now, usually it was built uh, at the home of his parents, so they would add on somewhere or it would be uh, uh, something they would build a house on the property of the groom's father or they'd be added on to his house. And that was the second phase. Now, when the home was ready, the father of the groom, not the father of the bride, I bet they're glad for that, you know, because I imagine some of the fathers of the brides would have said, no, we need chandeliers in every room, not just in the hallway, you know. So so the the groom's father would go inspect and he'd say, okay, it's ready. The house looks good. All the preparations are made. Everything's completed. Now go and get your bride. So that was kind of the process, that three steps of that process. So 
uh, at, at that point, they came to the wedding feast. And so not only was the house prepared, the, the place they would dwell was prepared, but also through that process, the wedding feast was prepared. When all of that took place, uh, they would go and they would uh, get their brides. Now, <clears throat> as I mentioned last week, the wedding feast was the grandest of all occasions. Uh, didn't matter if you were weak or, I mean, if you were uh, poor or if you were rich, didn't matter. The, the wedding banquet was the greatest thing they could afford, so they just poured a lot into that, and the bride and groom uh, would come together. The, the thing would last about a week, you know, at least a week, and then uh, at the end of the feast, the bride and groom would dismiss their guests. They would retreat to the wedding chamber, and the marriage would be consummated at that point. So that's the whole process. I don't want to spend a lot of time focusing on all the details, but uh, I pointed out in the previous series that we don't want to overanalyze these things. And, and the more I've studied these parables, the more I realize, and I've been guilty of this too, of, of overemphasizing what the parable really means. In other words, kind of taking the parable and looking at every little detail and trying to figure out what every little detail means. And, and there's quite a few commentators or commentaries that, that, that do the same thing. They'll take the parable and they'll... They'll just look, and, and in, in my opinion, they overanalyze stuff. And I'll give you an example of what I'm talking about. Some, some uh, commentators say, well, this, this, these virgins represent Christians who are pure, who've kept themselves pure and good moral character. Well, that may sound good, and you may can build a message around that, but that's not what the Bible says. <laughs> it's something that, that somebody has taken. They've looked at this parable, and they said, okay, what are these... What do these five uh, foolish and five wise virgins stand for? And they overanalyze that thing. I think you just look at it. Y'all remember when we first started talking about parables, it was just a, a story that's thrown up next to a truth to help us understand it. So I, I don't think we want to overanalyze things and, and make an assumption that it means something different. In most parables or most stories in Jewish writing, the the actual meaning is found in the middle of the story. So in this, verses 8 and 9, uh, and the foolish said, this is what the parable, the main, main parable is about. Uh, and the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil for your, our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, since there will not be enough oil for us uh, and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy some for yourself. So this morning I'm going to begin by kind of laying out the main theme of the parable, and, and then we'll look at how the rest of it, the parable, supports that main theme. But the first thing I want to tell you all a little story about running out of fuel wasn't me. Uh, I was coming from Paris. It's after we had already lived here. I was driving home, and uh, I was I think I was the lineman at the time, you know, and, and I looked over, and our, our district, our region, no, our district manager was sitting on the side of the road. And I went by, he was right there by the river. I went by and uh, I looked and I thought, well, that was Charles. So I turned around, I went back and uh, he was sitting in his car and I said, you having trouble? Yeah, I run out of gas. <laughs> and I said, well, I don't live far from here. I said, let me, I've got some gas in the can. I'll run home and get it. And man, I'm sorry. I, I was trying to get a hold of somebody. And so I ran home, I got him five gallons of gas. I don't know why I remember this so well. I came back with five gallons of gas. Now, you realize this, I'm, uh, I, I, I'm just, I'm a lineman, okay? He's a director. Well, that's salary-wise. There's going to be a difference there, of course. So I come back with my five gallons of gas. I, uh, he gets out. Of course, he's dressed in ice cream pants and real nice looking. You know, I'm on in my work clothes, and I pour the fuel in his car, and uh, set the can down behind his car, and I said, well, try to start it. Well, he yeah, 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 boom, 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 just drives off, leaves me standing there, never paid me for my gas. To this day, he's still alive, and I thought about calling and saying, Charles, you know you never paid me for that five gallons of gas. I gave you, and then you just drove off and left me standing on the side of the road. He didn't say thank you. He didn't say, man, that's perfect. I appreciate you doing that. He just drove off. I still don't understand why he just drove off other than if he was embarrassed because he had run out of gas. But uh, he, he, he made uh, this statement I'm going to make. He, he may not have uh, been exactly right. You can't live on somebody else's fuel. 
Now, he made it home on somebody else's fuel and never paid it back, but, but we can't live on somebody else's oil, and that's the kind of the parable that Jesus is teaching. All throughout God's Word, uh, it's all relevant to us, and, and uh, each time we've been looking at these parables, God is telling us about it's our responsibility to make decisions on our own. And last week we talked about this. Uh, there's parables that are kingdom parables, and all the ones we've talked about in these last four weeks have been kingdom parables. In other words, they're about the kingdom of God. He, he told a lot of different parables, but all of these are kingdom parables. They're all about the, the, the kingdom of God, and each one of them has, has had an element on how we get to heaven. And, and God, has, uh, Christ through his parables has shown us uh, how we get to heaven, and most of those things are spiritual and physical. Today, this is physical and spiritual. And what I mean by that, if you look at what Jesus said, he's talking about the physical kingdom, not just the spiritual kingdom, because he says, then the kingdom of heaven will be like, and then he gives the example. So, so he's talking about uh, primarily the, the aspects of the future kingdom. And he's telling the disciples that they, they need to be prepared. And even though this parable is about the future aspects of, of the physical kingdom, uh, it really shows us how we're to live today in the light or in the view of the kingdom to come. Now, the parable by itself is pretty simple. He says there's five wise bridesmaids and there are five foolish bridesmaids. And uh, the five wide, wise ones, hey, put that lamp up there. The five wise ones take their lamps, and they, uh, they have them ready to go. I, I thought this was pretty interesting. Uh, this would be, this, this is called a Jewish wedding uh, procession lamp. So the best we know, it would look a lot like this. So the thing I noticed about this is it has a little field hole, and it has a wick on that one end. And, and uh, so... The, the fuel would not have been visible. If you think about the oil lamps we have now, you know, you can see through them. You can see how much they're down. I've always kind of thought about these lamps of being a, like a, you're storming the castle and you're carrying this big stick with a lamp on the end of it. Well, that's not the case, you know. I probably even said that preaching about it before because when I, I got to studying this, that's more like what they would have. So these, these ten bridesmaids, uh, would have had something along this. They would have filled that, uh, that pitcher up with oil, and then, of course, they would have lit the wick. And, and the picture we get here is uh, they know that there's a time coming when the, the groom is going to say, hey, it's time to go. So they have their lamps. They have the oil, but, but five of them simply didn't prepare for that burning at night. And so when the bridegroom came, he came and said, hey, it's time to go. The wedding feast is ready. The food's getting cold. Y'all come on and get your lamps and follow us down there. And there would be this big procession to the wedding banquet. And so the, the foolish ones, I'm just repeating what we just read. They said, hey, we're out of oil. Maybe they left them burning. Maybe they, uh, maybe they just never really filled them up. Maybe they got to sloshing it around and said, man, we're just about out of oil. We're going to have to borrow some. Well, the, the wise, man said, the wise uh, bridesmaid said, no, there's, there's not enough oil. If we give you our oil, we're going to run out too, and, and we're not going to be able to make it there. So if you look at that, it may sound a little bit harsh, but, but the Jewish wedding, the bride and the uh, the bridegroom, they never knew exactly what time it was going to happen. So what Christ is teaching in this is we never know exactly when he's returning. So he's saying we need to be prepared day after day after day. The Bible says the Son of Man will come at an hour that you think not. I've talked about this several times. This morning, if we just took a poll and we said, I, you think the Lord is going to come tonight? I imagine... 99.9% .9 of us would say, I don't really think so. We might say, oh, I don't know, he could. But if we really got right down to it and we said, is the, is the groom going to come tonight? We're probably going to say, no, I, I don't really think so. And, and you, could, you can look at prophecy, and all the prophecies are fulfilled and being fulfilled every day, so there's no reason why we wouldn't think that. But Christ is simply saying this, 
Be prepared because you don't know when the Lord's going to return. Something else I want to, I want to point out. Now, again, I don't want to overanalyze things, but notice all the bridesmaids, both wise and foolish, slept at night. Now, like I say, I don't want to overanalyze this, but uh, I think it's a good reminder that we need to go about our daily business waiting on the Lord. In other words, we, we need to work, we need to eat, we need to sleep, we need to, we need to go about our daily business, but all the time we're going about our daily business, we're to be on watch. And we're not to sit idly by. You know, uh, we may get the idea, well, I need to sell all my possessions, I need to get everything prepared, pack my bags, and just sit and wait for the Lord to come. No, the Bible doesn't even say that. In Second Thessalonians, it says, work quietly and earn a living. So, I mean, while we wait on the Lord, we're waiting on something, but we're going on through the process of living our daily lives. And I think when we look at this story and we look at the parable, we go, well, they all just fell asleep. Well, it's the middle of the night. They were sleepy. They had to fall asleep. And, and so I think finally we need, to, or we need to really think about how God desires that we live our lives and we be prepared for his coming. The last thing, the grooms arise, he takes them to the wedding feast. Uh, five of them have to run to town and try to find something at the Dollar General and get some oil to pour in their lamps. And during that whole process, uh, they get back home and they pour oil in their lamps and they run down the road and they get to the wedding banquet. And what do they say? Well, it's too late. The doors are closed. They've been locked. Uh, you can't get in. It's too late. Well, this parable is telling us that there's going to be a time it can come at death. It can come when Christ turns, returns. When we die, our eternity is sealed. That's it. I mean, that's just that's not a Baptist thing. That's not an ideal I've got. The Bible teaches that. When 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 we die or when Christ comes, we can't say, "Well, let me run over here and uh, I'm going to get some oil and I'm going to be prepared." And God, I'll be there in just a few minutes. You know it. Uh, I talked about this one time in the past that when we were kids, we had those Bibles that had pictures of all the, the stories in the Old Testament. And I remember the picture of the ark floating and, and all of these people in a panicked look trying to beat on the door and get into the ark. You know, that just kind of stuck with me. And, and that's just an ideal of, as Jesus is teaching, that, that there's a time coming if we're not prepared that the door is going to be shut, the wedding banquet, the guests are in, and, and the door is shut. So Jesus uses this parable like others to make it clear that uh, his return may not be as quick as they thought. See, they had enough oil for a short time, but wasn't as quick as they thought, but they should be prepared. And, and you know, the, the Bible says we shouldn't be uh, wondering why God hadn't returned because he's patient, not wanting any to perish. It's not He's not long uh, in his return. He's just being patient, and that's what we need to, to remember. So the first thing here is, is the idea of living on someone else's oil. First, since the primary parable about the future, the physical kingdom of Jesus, uh, it, it's, it's, it's important for us to think about, are we prepared for that? Have we been prepared? I read this story. It's kind of a sad story. Uh, but it's about Ivan McGuire. I'm sure probably none of y'all have heard of him. In April of 1988, he was a veteran skydiver. He was an instructor on skydiving. He was going to film another instructor and his student as they jumped out of a plane. So he jumped out of the plane with them. He had a camera on his helmet. He began to film the other two. Uh, he had a voice-activated camera, so when he would talk, the camera would come on. It's attached to his helmet. Everything's going well. They're, they're falling together. He's filming all those things. He, this is a true story. He reaches for his rip cord to uh, deploy his parachute, and he realizes that he had mistakenly put his camera gear on, thinking he had on his parachute. He didn't have a parachute on. He, 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 he gets there, he's grabbing for the strap. At this point, the video shows his hands, his arms flailing about trying to find something. It's just not there. Of course, he descended to his death. So to think about that, that, that illustration that gives us today as we think about this parable, the first is that no one else can enter the kingdom of God 
on someone else's behalf. In other words, if Ivan McGuire died, or he died because it was not possible for him to wear somebody else's chute, there was two more people there that had chutes on, but it wasn't possible for him to, to make it to safety by using their chute. Once he jumped from the plane, there was safety in the plane. There was a parachute for him in the plane, but once he jumped from the plane, he was the only one that had the ability to save himself. Now, here's the good thing. We don't have to save ourselves. God desires to save us. We come to him, and we're saved on, but because what Christ done for us, not on our own merit. So that's one thing. The second point here is that uh, there was a point that it was too late. Ivan realized when he's falling and they, whatever, uh, whatever altitude they decide it's time to pull the chute, he, he realized at that point it's too late. I, there's nothing I can do uh, at, at this point. So, so that's the way it is at the time of our death, at our physical death, our, our, our eternity is sealed. Now, I'm not trying to scare you. I'm just simply saying this is what Jesus was teaching his disciples. And the Bible says it's appointed once for a man to die and after that face judgment. That's, that's Hebrews 9.27. All of us are going to die, but there's not a second chance. There are some Christian organizations and, and I say religious, religions out there that, that somehow teach that you can die and you can just pray somebody and you can pray for them that God would forgive them and that God would let them come to heaven and over time they can just be moved right on into heaven. That, is, that ain't even in the Bible anywhere. That's just something that somebody came up with that probably soothes their self to say, well, you know, I'm just going to pray this person on into heaven and I'm going to pray on their behalf and God, I'm coming on behalf of this person that died and I'm asking that you'd forgive their sins. I'm asking that you'd bring them to heaven. I'm asking that you'd do all of these things for them. That, that sounds really good, but that's not, that's not the case. Those two guys jumping... As, as I can just imagine, as they watched uh, Ivan just continue to fall, they, they may have said, boy, if you could get my shoot, I could help you. If I could reach you, I could help you. But, but there was no help there. And folks, when it comes right down to the bottom line is we go to heaven on our own oil, on our own, on our own decisions. We can't enter. You may say, well, I've been a good person and my parents were a part of this church and my parents were Christians and I had to go to church and I had to do all these things. And, and, but if we've never accepted Christ as our Savior, we're trying to go on somebody else's oil. Matter of fact, today we may be saying, well, Jake, you get up and preach every week, and I agree with what you say, and I hear what you say, and I'm going to get there because I completely agree with everything we talked about. Well, that's my oil, okay? And what we have to do is say, God, because I believe I want my own oil. I, God, I want you to save me. I want you to forgive me on my, own, on my profession of faith in you. I want you to fill my oil. And that's how we get to heaven. There's a second level that this par parable operates on. Uh, and it's the part of the kingdom that uh, we'd say even this parable's a primary focus on the kingdom of God. It talks about how we're to live our lives today. How are we to live our lives today? Uh, unfortunately, there's a lot of Christians that, that don't experience fulfillment in their Christian life today. And I think the reason is a lot of times we live our lives simply saying, I want to go through the motions and we want to live on our past victories. We want to live on the ideal of, of our spiritual tanks are running on empty and, and it's become tougher and tougher and trials come and they point to Jesus and they give Jesus all of these reasons and all of these lists of things of why am I dealing with this and why am I facing this. And the bottom line is the lamp's about out of oil and it's flickering. Now, don't get this wrong. I'm not saying Christ abandons us, leaves us. I'm not saying we lose our salvation. I'm saying we quit filling ourselves with the Spirit of God. You know, that's an ongoing process. You're not, you're not saved and born again and God gives you the Holy Spirit and that's the end of everything. There's a constant renewing of the Spirit of God. There's a constant, there's a constant coming to God's Word and being equipped with God's Word and learning more about God's Word. And when we do that, we're filling that oil up with lamp. Uh, we're filling that lamp up with oil. I was reminded, and this is not my ideal, but, but it talks about when we get tired and we get burnt out and we get 
tired of going through the same old motions. I, I heard a preacher say, think about the burning bush that Moses went to. It says he looked at the bush and he noticed a strange sight that the bush was on fire burning. If y'all seen any of those pictures of Louisiana fire and Jasper fires, isn't that amazing? It's just blazes, you know, hundreds of feet in the air and, and just this deep red color everywhere. Moses looked at that bush and he said, man, here I am in the desert and here's a bush that's burning but it's not being consumed. What was in that bush? What did God say? He said, Moses, take off your shoes for the place you're standing is holy ground. God had filled that bush with his presence. And even though the bush was on fire, it didn't burn up. So what am I saying? I'm saying sometimes when we as Christians begin to burn out, maybe we're fueling ourselves with our own fuel because if God has filled us, we're not going to burn out. We're not, going to, we're not going to be consumed with the worries and the troubles and all the things that we face today because the Spirit of God has filled us. And if we're in that place today spiritually, we need to back up and say, God, you know what? I think I'm out of gas. I'm just, I think I'm running on fumes, and I need you to fill me with your Spirit. And the way we do that is not simply to ask, but we're to go to God's Word, we're to study, we're to look, and allow God to fill us with His Spirit, and then that fires us back up. I hope on Sundays when we come to church, I hope that we come and maybe we're, we're just kind of sputtering along on our fuel, and we hear the Sunday school teacher, and we study our Sunday school lesson, and we come and we hear a message, and, and it inspires us to get into God's Word and study God's Word, and we leave here and we say, you know what? Whew, I'm energized for this week. I got another week ahead of me, but, but I'm ready because, not because of what Jake said, not because of anything, but the Spirit of God has filled us and prepared us for our service this week. That's an ongoing spirit. That's an ongoing feeling for us. And I do my best each week, believe it or not, to study God's Word, to know uh, how to share God's Word, and, and, and to, to try to help us all understand. But only the Spirit of God can fill us. Only the Spirit of God can fill you. Only the Spirit of God can apply the truths of what you hear. So I, I always want to pray that you would say, God, today, and I ask you to pray this so often, God, Speak to me and fill me with your spirit. Because when we do that, our oil is revived, it's new, it's filled up. And, and we're trimming those wicks a little bit and we're prepared to serve him. I found this article, and this is where I want to close this morning. It's Aaron Loy is the guy that wrote it. He wrote a book, in, or this article, and he wrote five really bad reasons to leave your church. I think some of his observations are pretty good. Uh, I had two of them that I... That I, that I wrote down, I thought were pretty good. Here's the first. Now, I've heard these. That's why I thought they were good, I guess. I'm not being fed. Okay, so I'm going to leave. Uh, in the term of today's parable, we could rephrase that like this. Uh, I'm not getting enough of somebody else's oil. What did I say when, when I preach a lot of times? That, that may be some of my oil. You can't get there on what my oil is. So, so basically like that. But this Mr. Law, he, he responded best, better than I could. So he said, to leave a church because you're not getting enough substance is a cop-out. Your primary call in the church is to contribute, not just consume. Now, think about that. Your primary call in the church is contribute, not just consume. As a Christian, you shouldn't require spoon-feeding for the rest of your life. Eventually, you need to learn how to feed yourself so that in time you can actually begin to feed others. Remember, your call is not just to be a disciple, but to make disciples. That's pretty good. And I'd encourage you, if you're in a church or you go to a church that God's Word's not being taught, then you need to question that. But if God's Word is being taught, then don't come so much saying, give me all you got and fill me. I want to see. You just impress me this morning but come ready to hear God's word and respond to God's word. Here's the second thing. My needs are not being met. Are not being met. That's another I want to share you his response. The church doesn't exist to meet your needs. Now, this is his words. You're a part of the church, and that exists to meet the needs of the world. So put away the shopping cart and pick up a shovel. <laughs> I like that. 
My needs just aren't being met. The church does not exist to meet your needs. You're a part of the church that exists to meet the needs of the world. So put away the shopping cart, pick up a shovel. You know, this Mr. Lloyd's really just making the same point that we find in this parable today. Uh, we can't live on somebody else's oil. I want to ask you to bow your heads, and I want you to think about this. Are you, are you running on empty today? You know, God desires that, that we would be on fire for him, but not burn out for him. God desires that not that we die for him, but that we live for him. If you're a Christian this morning and you're, you're just running on fumes, make sure you're not trying to live on the fuel of somebody else. But this morning, would you just make that your prayer? God, you know, I'm tired. I'm, I'm just running on fumes. I need, to, I need your spirit to re-energize me and uh, fill me up again, Lord. I just need, I need a fresh start, a fresh wind, a fresh fire. The other part is, have you asked for that oil of the Spirit? You know, the Bible talks about, as it talks about oil so often, it's talking about the Spirit of God also. I want to ask you, have you made preparations for yourself? Are you thinking, well, I'll run down to Dollar General when it gets closer. I'll, boy, I've got a few more things to do in my life, but then, but, but I'm going to get it straight. Before God returns. At an hour you think not, the Son of Man comes. Those, those ten brides fell asleep and the, the call came that the, the bridegroom's coming. The fathers made preparations. That, of course, is a picture of God the Father and Jesus Christ, the bridegroom. And five of them said, oh, let's run and get ready right quick. Christ teaches us in this parable that we don't know but we should be prepared. If you've never made preparations by accepting Christ your personal Savior, I want to give you an opportunity to do that right now. Let's pray together, and then we're going to have an invitation here in just a moment. This morning, I want to ask you again, would you pray that the Holy Spirit of God might fill you, if you're a born-again Christian, that you'd be filled with His Spirit, filled with, uh, filled with that, that joy of service that comes through Him. If you've never accepted Christ, would you ask that God would speak to you this morning and call you unto himself? The invitation says this, Jesus is tenderly calling today, calling you home. Why from the sunshine of love will you roam farther and farther away? Jesus is calling today. Father, I pray this morning as we Think about this parable that you've taught us, Lord, that there's a physical and a spiritual kingdom, Father. We live in the spiritual world today. And, Father, you desire that we would be your hands and your feet. We'd, you desire that we would be ministering to others, Father. And, Lord, you desire to give us the, the spirit. You desire to give us the umption to be able to go and do that. And, Father, also we know there's a physical kingdom. And, Lord, you tell us to be prepared for that day. There's that you're going to come in an hour like a thief in the night, uh, Father, and I pray that we'd be prepared. If there'd be any be here today that's never accepted you today, Lord, I pray that your spirit would move within their heart. Call them to yourself, Lord, and I pray if there'd be others today that just need to rededicate their life to you, Father, your spirit would direct them in that way, Lord. We just ask that your spirit would lead us, teach us, guide us today in all that we do during this time of invitation, and we pray this in your name.